Okay. So uh, we want to talk about, uh, we'll talk about the fall of Aleppo. And uh, regardless of the personal touching stories of what's happened, at the end, we who work in the humanitarian field think that oh, it's all about politics, even, even the work that we work in. And how Aleppo fall, there are many, many stories about how and why, but we know exactly at least the tactic that the Syrian regime and its allies used to seize the, uh, the eastern part of the city, which was non-government areas. Um, and I think as the majority of you are interested and following up on the news in Syria, know a little bit about the history of the city, know what happened during 2014, 2015, how barrel the bomb, uh, bombs were used widely on the city. Um, one example in 2014, the rate of barrel bombs falling on the city was 40 barrel bombs a day in, in, in an area which uh, if, if you look here, this is, this is the eastern part of Aleppo, the city, and this is the Castello Road. This is 13 kilometers only. 40 barrel bombs in this area every day. This is a rate of one year. But still, 250,000 people decided to stay, not to leave. And they have hundreds of causes to stay in their own city, in their own neighborhoods. They didn't leave, in spite of all the bombs falling on them. Day after day, the usage of siege was very clear in Syria, and many besieged areas ended with forced displacement of the population. So we, as humanitarian workers, I work in a medical NGO providing medical services in Syria with many colleagues working in other NGOs, we know this tactic, and, and we know many other tactics which push people to leave their homeland. One of them, the siege. The other is attacks on health. The other is usage of unconventional weapons. And in Aleppo, there was a mix of all of those. And I, I lived in, in a, one of the besieged towns in Syria, in Eastern Ghouta, till 2014. And uh, I was telling the stories as, as Lena did now, and as you saw in the film, the stories of the people in the siege. When I, when I fled out of the country and, and started to look at the strategical level of the humanitarian aid which, which delivered to Syria, I, I started to be more interested in the statistics and numbers and how we are, in a way or another, related to politics things. Uh, one, one very clear example, a permission to go to any of the besieged areas to deliver aid, food, medical supplies, the permission have to be done by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, not the Ministry of Health, not, the, not any one of those ministries. It's the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So it's, it's all about politics, even, even the aid that we, we do in Syria. So, in the beginning of this, the, 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 the photo on the left, the map on, on, on the left, this is January the 1st, 2016. And we, we could see as humanitarian NGOs that the battle is to seize the road, the Castello Road, which lead to the city. We were using this road here till here, then it's, it's too, too risky to go there, so we were going here from Kafar Hamra and then the Castello again, till we ended inside the city, as humanitarian workers. We have about 50 doctors for this population. 35 are only on shift. The other 15 are going to the other non-government areas or to Turkey, where their families are based, and 35 still inside the city. Aid was delivered through this road and we could realize this since the beginning of January 2016. So we started to increase the capacity to bring more aid, increasing the, uh, the, the, the supplies in our warehouses, being prepared for the siege. 
But for me, as one who experienced siege, I know it's not just medical supplies and food. When you live in siege, you miss everything. Like in, in my area, which is an area depend on agriculture, and we have huge livestock. It's the, the, the biggest livestock in, in, in Syria, in, in Eastern Ghouta, on Damascus countryside. We could have meat, milk. But one example, when you go to bring milk from a grocery, they don't have plastic bags to give you milk. They don't have anything to, to give you milk. So have, you have to, 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 to bring your own bottle with you to, to, to get milk. Meat, there, there's no plastic bags to, to sell. So it, you will miss something, and, and you will not be able to eat. Gas, fuel, many things. But people build alternatives all the time. People are creative. And, and in many parts of the world, people live without electricity. So we could live without electricity. People of Aleppo live without electricity since 2012, completely without electricity. For people who lived in urbans, they will think about, how can I even make a cup of coffee? How can I even have a bath with, with hot water? People will find alternatives for, for this. People could find also alternatives to protect themselves in living under the attacks of barrel bombs. They dig them under the ground. One example is hospitals. The majority of the hospitals in Syria are underground facilities. And we fortified our hospitals in the very simple tools that we have. Sandbags, using basements, any tool that we can. We, we stopped using the higher floors, and then trying to at least decrease the damage when, when a facility is attacked and to protect the, the very precious, the medical staff. And then look at July the 1st, 2016. Look at the difference here between here, this area, and only this. Here now the Syrian regime forces have a sniper to cut the road six months to, take, to seize just this area because it's very important for the city. A sniper here could cut the, the road. And in July, we had a mission of three American doctors inside Aleppo. They were helping their colleagues, their Syrian colleagues inside the city. And they could hardly survive outside of the city after seven days mission. Look at the map. July 15, within 15 days, now the forces are very close to the, to the road. And then July 27th, exactly, the Syrian regime seized the road leading to the city, and the, seat, the city is completely besieged. And here it's not an access because it's monitored by the snipers. August the 1st. The city is besieged completely. And then the reaction here. Look at the mentality of the people. Look how siege, look how people believe that time that they, they can survive, they can peer, they can, they can live in the city. And then the armed groups opened the road from the south, from Ramuse. And you could deliver very few aid to the city. It's only one month and six days. And then quickly, the regime sees the area, and the whole city is besieged again. October the 1st. Look how the map is changing quickly. November the 1st. This area, Sabil, is at the 1st of October with the opposition, and then here it's with the regime. How? By severe attacks on everything, including health facilities, schools, uh, warehouses, everything. In one neighborhood, the regime was attacking all the city, but, but focusing on one neighborhood where the people will fled out because they don't have any other choice. They will die if they stay in, in, the, in, in this place. But till that time, people of Aleppo believe that they can survive. And if I want to go back here, when, the, when we open this, this route here, 
and the Andrew group allowed us as a humanitarian to, to use the route here, the 30, 35 doctors and the 15 outside, what happened? Five from the 15 decided to go inside, none from the 35 who were inside fled out. They want to live in the city, they want to stay in the city, they want to help their people. Very few families went out at that time. So till that time, people of Aleppo want to stay home. They don't want to leave their homeland. And then November the 1st, November 15th, December the 1st, we started asking to evacuate the people. The people of Aleppo on December the 1st started asking of evacuation. The same people who didn't leave four years under ballot bombs, who didn't leave four years without electricity, without pure water, even without food. And, and starvation, when we, when we say that Aleppo was under the risk of, of starvation, till that moment it was not. Because the warehouses were enough to feed the population. Medical supplies, no. But what happened which made the people here change their mind and decide to leave December 13, when the agreement from the uh, Russian government, they were the sponsorship the sponsor, uh, they, uh, of, of, of this agreement of evacuating the people. And it is December 23rd, when all the uh, population, the 250,000 uh, people were out of the city. Well, if, if, if we look at the number of besieged people on uh, here in November uh, 2016 and October 2017 now, there was 975,000 people who were besieged at that time, and now we have 540 people. The 400,000, the siege was not broken. All of them were displaced. All of them. So siege ended displacing people from their homeland. This is, this is the tactic. This is the scenario. Now, we don't discuss any other scenario when we know that there's a besieged area. Attacks on health. And why, why I'm mentioning attacks on health? Of course, because I'm, I'm coming from medical background. And I work in medical NGO, I'm, I'm very interested in this. But for, for five years now, health is very visible. As I said, you will live in a place without electricity. You can find alternative for everything, for, even for food. Even it was very difficult in, in a city like Aleppo where there's no agriculture, there's no uh, livestock, why it's much easier in other towns where they depend on agriculture. And you, you, you saw during the film the photos which was projected uh, how this is the territories of, of Aleppo, the city. There's no place to, uh, to do any agriculture in, 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 in the city. But health is very visible. You will not live in a place where you know if you are injured, you will not have a place to be treated. You will not live in a place where you know if you are, if, if I question several after the presentation, too. So uh, attacks on health, du during the second half of 2016, there was 173 attacks, 42% of them, uh, which is 72 attacks on Aleppo, the city. One example is M10 Hospital. M10 Hospital is a big hospital in, in Al Sahur area, which is a uh, poor neighborhood. Uh, people didn't get uh, advanced uh, medical treatment. We built the hospital, which was a hospital before, like it was used as a hospital since before 2011. And uh, we tried to bring advanced equipment, mammograph as example, which was a dream for those people to have mammograph uh, in, in, in such a hospital. And it was attacked 12 times. Deliberate attack was very clear. The tactic was very clear. But fortification could help to, to, to keep the hospital functioning till the, as we were finding alternatives, the regime also find, found alternatives, which is the bunker buster bomb. Uh, I don't 
<laughs> which, which resources is Russian or uh, another, but the bunker buster can penetrate any fortification and can destroy any building. So the, the hospital was destroyed and went out of duty. And then people of Asahur went out, went out to another neighborhood. And then focusing again on another neighborhood, attacking the hospital, the civil defense centers, uh, schools. And the schools are very, very important. And, and I was telling Lena yesterday about a story. One, one village was, was attacked severely and the people then were evacuated to another village. And then they opened the school as a shelter. The evacuees said no. Where will our kids go tomorrow? They will not find a school, not sleep in the school. They'll sleep in the nowhere, but, but the school is for education. It's not a shelter. So pe people, people realize the, the importance of education. Uh, the 33 doctors, uh, I want to tell all, all, always tell the story of the number of, of doctors in Syria. In 2010, we have one doctor for every 600 Syrians. Now we have one doctor for every 2,650 Syrian, uh, Syrians. 27,000 Syrian doctors fled out of the country. In Aleppo that time, we have one doctor for every 7,500. So the capacity was very poor. We could only provide the primary health care and uh, serve the, the injuries. And, and then you have only very few services that, that you can provide, especially because of lack of access. The third tactic, which is the usage of unconventional weapons. Uh, but, but till now, over 200 uh, uh, times the chemical weapons were used in, in Syria. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know that there are, till now, three investigation bodies investigating chemical attacks in Syria. And there are reports confirmed by those uh, entities confirming uh, that the, the, the regime is responsible of, of those attacks, like the Joint Investigation Mechanism, which is a body combined between the uh, organization of prohibition of chemical weapons and the UN. They investigated nine chemical attacks. They said five, we didn't have sufficient information. Four of them, three, the Syrian regime. The fourth is ISIS. Uh, but the, the, I, I witnessed the, the chemical massacre in, in Eastern Ghouta. The chemical weapons didn't kill much peop more people than what other weapons did. But it's all about fear and about how those weapons can affect the psychology of the community, of the society. And how can, can those weapons push the people to surrender or to flee? Where are the people now? 250,000. Well, uh, as any humanitarian respond, coordination between UN agencies, NGOs. We started preparing for the evacuation and negotiating with the stakeholders to, to evacuate the people of Aleppo. We documented uh, 38,600 38, people who were evacuated to the non-government areas, to, the, uh, to, to, to Idlib and the, the uh, western countryside of, of Aleppo. And uh, the Syrian government and humanitarian actors who work from the government areas, from the western side of, of Aleppo, documented 51,000 people. Where the, where, where the others went? No one knows. No one has accurate information about this. No one knows if those people are safe or not. Because what, what was happening that time, if you go to the map again, when, when the regime sees such an area crowded, then not all the people will, will be able to flee. You can imagine how under those attacks, there's, sometimes there's no access even. They, they have don't vehicle. Uh, some of them are disabled. So the, the regime sees the area, and many people are still at home. And many people will maybe through paying for the checkpoints for the soldiers themselves, go to the, their relatives to the uh, western side of, of the city, taking this way. Some of them went through. Th this area, Sheikh Maqsoud, 
this is controlled by the uh, YBJ, Kurdish forces here. So many of them also have some relations with them, and they went through this area, but all of those are not documented. And when we ended evacuating the people, we were asking, uh, we have been giving reports about the people, the response, the humanitarian needs, everything to our uh, partners, the UN agencies, the stakeholders, every country who is interested, all the embassies, everything we are trying to help. But no reports were coming from the other side, from the government areas. And they, then the UN agencies started coordinating. They have been coordinating with the, with, the, with the UN agencies based in Damascus and NGOs based in Damascus. And some reports started to come about the response. And they said, I, I remember UN OCHA said that the, the uh, humanitarian actors working from government areas are allowed to provide shelter, food, health, but definitely not a protection monitoring. So no one could account how many people went to jail, how many people were killed, how many people stayed at home. This is why the uh, big number of population, we don't know where, where they went. And uh, this is uh, Salim. Salim is a dentist. This is his last day in Aleppo, uh, December 15. Uh, this is the facility where he used to, to work. And he wrote, oh, he wrote this. There are things here that might be useful to your kids. Don't destroy the place. Aleppo, Syria, Hurriye. And Salim now is is in Turkey telling the story to everyone. Maybe, maybe he could find many people to listen, but this is, didn't change anything. Still now we have 540,000 people are besieged. The same tactic is used. Chemical weapons were used in 2017 10 times. The, commission, the UN Commission of Inquiry confirmed that all the 10 usage of chemical weapons were done by the Syrian government. But there's no, no real uh, steps toward accountability in this country. And the only thing which might stop all of this is accountability, which now is a dream for, for someone like me. I've been working on, on, on this field all, all this time. Uh, Aleppo was different. Yes, it was different. It was different. but from any, any other city. I'm not from Aleppo. I visited Aleppo three times in my life. I, live, I lived in, in Damascus countryside. But, but we as humanitarian workers, we thought that time that this is one of the oldest city in the world. It means a lot for many people. And uh, Halabi people from Aleppo uh, are very active and they have huge uh, uh, networks and uh, uh, communications every place, and they 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 have their own communities every place they go to, and they they could raise the voice to the, to the to the highest level, but it didn't work. There is a deal, of course, there is a deal. Quickly like this, watching usage of chemical weapons six times. If I went back to the user, six times from. November 17 to December 13, one of them was on a hospital. And once it was a basement where a family of six people live in and the six died. No one paid attention to this. The, the, the international community were just watching. And uh, I, I remember a story of, of the we have only three gynecologists in, in this city. For 250,000 people, the productive Syrians, uh, we have high rates of birth in, even in the city. Uh, sometimes we reach 700 birth every month. The rate was between 300 and 400 every month, you can imagine, which is higher than any other place in the, in the region, maybe. Uh, 
And then Farida is, is that gynecologist, one of them. She was in, in a place where she has a pregnant woman preparing her for the delivery, and then uh, the, the chemical bomb uh, was dropped on the hospital. She survived with the pregnant and only the, uh, the ambulance driver. All the, the other staff were uh, contaminated and they were delivered to, to, to a very near uh, medical, small medical facility to be treated. And then there was no access to, to other neighborhoods in, in, in the city. And the only uh, hospital which, wa which had the capacity at that time was Al-Quds Hospital. Uh, and the, uh, the ambulance driver took her with the, with, the, with the pregnant to that facility. And she delivered the baby. Uh, it was a boy. And Farida, when, when every time she, she tells the story, she cried because uh, she left her husband, who was, who was also a doctor, in, in the hospital who was uh, affected by the, by, by the chemical weapon and, and decided to, to help the, uh, the pregnant. Uh, but F Farida now, one example, Farida works still now in Aleppo countryside. She didn't leave. And people still, people, those people who live in Aleppo countryside still have some hope. For me, I don't. But I, I don't, they, 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 they still have hope that they will be back one day uh, to their city. Thank you very much.